Hey everybody, this is Aaron from Aaron's Audio Corner, and today I'm going to review the SCAR IX12 subwoofer. This is a 12-inch subwoofer. I ordered this on Amazon Prime for 50 bucks shipped to my door, and dude, that's a stupid, stupid cheap price, right? So you got to think, how much performance am I getting for that? Well, that's what I'm here today to show you. I am using Clipple products to objectively measure the excursion, the thill small parameters, the frequency response, and the distortion parameters for this drive unit. I'll explain to you what those results mean and provide you with a conclusion on my thoughts of the actual performance of this $50 subwoofer. If you're new to this channel, if you don't mind, please go ahead and hit the subscribe button and give me a thumbs up and or leave a comment below to let me know what you think about this content. I don't generally test subwoofer drive units, but I figured nobody else is doing it. I might as well start. So, latch this up, push the stand down, good to go, latch it back in place, and clamp it down. Attaching the speaker to the stand, and that way when we start running the laser on it, which you can see the little laser beam right there, the laser will determine how much excursion the woofer has, and through a series of calculations in the software, it will determine how much is linear excursion versus how much is more distortion excursion. And uh, yeah, I'm going to hook this up, and then I'm going to begin testing. First test is the thill small parameters using the Clipple LSI and the Clipple LPM modules. All right, when I perform my testing for thill small parameters, I always take a drive unit and if it's new, I will break it in, basically means that I will test it multiple times, sending it low power just to test the impedance. And then I will give it a lot of power for a little while to kind of loosen up the suspension and then I'll test it again. And I repeat that process over and over until I get to the point where the TS parameters are essentially the same. And once I get to that point, then I continue with the rest of my testing. So what we're gonna start right now with is the TS parameters. Now, this is with the subwoofer wired up into a 4 ohm final nominal load, not with a 1 ohm because it is capable of 4 or 1, depending on how you configure the DVCs. And we have an RE of 3.6, LE of 1.373. The LE is really high. The inductance is, is very, very high for this drive unit. The FS is 30.6. Uh, I clocked in MMS at 136, and the manufacturer doesn't have MMS on their website. I don't believe. If they do, it's it's hidden. It's not right up front, and by that, I'll show you what I mean. If I grab their product and I go to their description, uh, sorry, go to their specifications. They don't have MMS listed in here, but we're going to look at BLs, 11.9, FS, 35.4. So let me drag this back over here and get this out of my way. Uh, again, I measured an FS of 30.6, so about 5 hertz off of that. BL, they had 11.9, I have 12.4. Uh, that's not a big, huge difference. Uh, the QTS is 0.556, VAS, here spec. So if you want, you can pause your screen. You can take a screenshot of this. These are their measured parameters. However, what I will say, instead of using these parameters for modeling an enclosure, what you should use is a different set of parameters, which is obtained from the LSI module from the Clipple. And what that does is it gives you the actual parameters taken while the speaker is being played. Because drive unit parameters can change when the speaker is actually being played. So using the being played parameters will give you a better approximation of an ideal uh, enclosure for when you go to model it. And these are the parameters I use to model an enclosure. The one thing that the Clipple LSI module provides you that everybody is eager to know is linear excursion. Now that is a measure of the excursion of the drive unit based on a distortion threshold. And for subwoofers, that distortion threshold is 20% THD. And it breaks the 
motor and the suspension down into individual components and it will measure each of those and depending on the input of those components you will reach that threshold that total threshold of 20 percent thd and doing that leaves me with a limitation at linear x max of 4.1 millimeters one way due to inductance variation if you look at the bl you can see it is 8.2 millimeters one way and then the suspension based distortion is greater than 11.9 so that means the suspension could actually go further than this 11.9 but that was as far as i needed to push it in order to resolve the parameters that i'm talking about here these values ultimately mean that distortion wise the most linear throw that this subwoofer has is 4.1 millimeters one way. What do I mean by that? Well, let's go look at the inductance variation. This is displacement over inductance. So what this means is as the voice coil is going outward or as the cone is traveling outward, the inductance is decreasing. But as the voice coil moves inward into the gap, the inductance increases. If they had used something like a shorting ring, they would have actually lowered this inductance probably a, a good bit. This, it, I should say this inductance swing a good bit. And that would have made this number higher. And ultimately what that would have given them the ability to do is claim a higher linear excursion um, due to the improvement there. Now, if you wanna see what the motor force looks like over excursion, you can see that the motor is actually pretty good. There is some uh, asymmetry, just, just meaning that there is more of a forward or an outward inset of the uh, voice coil in the gap. And the easy way to check that is to go in here and look at the symmetry. So basically what this is showing us is that at rest, the voice coil is inset by about, that's such an itty bitty number, uh, 0.2 millimeters, which is nothing. And then at full excursion, measured at about 13 millimeters, it is about 0.26 out. So not much of a change there. And then if we wanna go and look at the suspension, now we can see that there is a difference in the outward displacement going toward the right versus the inward displacement going to the left. And if you go and look at the symmetry to break that down a little bit more finely, you can see that the voice coil position due to the suspension is a, almost about 1.9 millimeters outward, which means that the Suspension is causing the voice coil to be lifted out of the gap about 1.9 millimeters uh, from its net zero. So if they could fix that, they would increase that linear excursion value for the suspension. But really, it's not a big of a factor because the suspension is the least limiting factor here. But ultimately, I think what everybody really wants to know is what is the linear excursion and linear excursion is limited here to 4.1 millimeters one way due to inductance variation. And that is the maximum allowable per the 20% THD uh, parameter. Now you guys might be interested in knowing what the TS parameters are at a one ohm final load. This is it. But again, if you're going to model it, I would probably model it based on what I provided you previously. Unfortunately, I didn't have the time to do a one ohm load with the large plus cold parameters. So, mm, sorry. Using the Earthworks M23 microphone, I measured the frequency response open air on the test stand. First thing before I even show you the frequency response is, this is not at 2.83 volts. I'm just, this is the number on the left, the SPL is basically arbitrary. The microphone was placed near the cone in the near field, but we can see the general shape is that there is a bump right here in the mid base region, and then it kind of tapers off and gets a little bit more flat. And yeah, so this is your frequency response. Now let's talk about distortion. I run distortion tests at multiple output levels. And the first one I start off with is 2.83 volts because that's pretty standard. And we can see that at 2.83 volts, which is an SPL around 86 dB or so at 60 Hertz, it's, it's kind of in that neighborhood. We are under 3% THD. 3% will be noted by this negative 30 because negative 30 dB relative to the fundamental is 3% distortion. And then if I go up to another plus six dB, so, so taking that 86 dB and adding six to it, so now at 92 dB, 
We are just over the 3% distortion limit at between, what is that, maybe 40 to about 90 hertz. And then if we add 12 dB to that 2.83, now we're at about 12 plus 86 is 98. So at 98 dB at one meter, we are almost at 10%. So the negative 20 dB line is about 10% THD. So you can see that the distortion creeps up pretty quickly as you step into the into the voltages. Now, keep in mind that this is the subwoofer measured on the stand in free air. There is no enclosure here. So obviously there is no benefit from an enclosure providing extra air suspension inside and providing you with a little bit better low frequency response. So this is really just to give you an apples to apples representation for other tests going forward. But the bottom line here is that the distortion creeps up as you increase output, that's not really unexpected, but now you got the data to kind of understand the components of the distortion. The last test that I do for distortion testing is a multi-tone distortion and compression test, which I'll show a clip of here. And using this allows me to set thresholds that I want to define as a maximum threshold that the distortion or the compression cannot exceed. And once the values do exceed that threshold, then the subwoofer test or the, the drive unit test is considered failed and then the testing stops. The thresholds I'm using for this test are for compression, 3 dB. So if the drive unit exceeds 3 dB and loss of output due to power input, then the test fails. The other parameter is negative 20 dB in distortion, which is 10% distortion. And the reason I chose those is because we are a little bit less receptive to distortion on the low frequency scale than we are the higher to mid range frequency scale. So I gave me a little bit of slack on the subwoofers here and I'll do that for all the subwoofers going forward. But now that you know that, let's actually look at the results. This result is providing you a baseline comparison of one volt input versus another number of steps of voltage input. And what you're seeing here is compression over frequency. The compression is on the Y axis and the frequency is on the X axis. And I tested from 20 Hertz to 200 Hertz. And what you see here is that as you increase the voltage into the subwoofer, you actually gain more output through distortion on the low end below about what frequency is this? Let's see here. Uh, below about 40 Hertz and then going above 40 Hertz or really 45 Hertz, you lose output due to compression, which means that the more power you pump into this thing, the less output that you're getting above 45 Hertz. But the more power that you're pumping into this thing, the more output you're getting below 45 Hertz because of distortion. It's weird, huh? So now, you know, and as I said, the other portion of this test is the distortion testing. So I set this threshold to be negative 20 dB, again, 10% distortion. And you can see that the distortion limit is exceeded at 14 volts at about this frequency, about 90 Hertz or so. I can add 14 dB to that 86. So about 100 dB is where this subwoofer fails the thresholds that I have set. It does not mean that it won't get louder than 100 dB. That's not what this test is saying. This test is simply saying that due to the thresholds that I have defined, the maximum SPL for this subwoofer is 100 dB at one meter, and that is due to the distortion parameters. And that wraps up the testing. But before I leave, let me show you guys something real fast. Now I mentioned that I had used the TS parameters uh, from the LSI module to calculate enclosure sizes. So what we see here is we're going to color all these out. This first blue that I have is the subwoofer in a sealed enclosure, which is what when ISD tells me it would be better suited in. And with the QTC of 0 0.707, now that box size is 5.4 cubic feet. That's a big box. So what happens if I use the manufacturer's spec at what is it, 1.25 cubic feet sealed? That gets me this response. So it gets you a little bit of a bump in the uh, 60 hertz region. So more in the mid base region, you get a bit more output, but you can see that it starts falling off pretty rapidly below maybe 
40, 30 hertz, something like that. So that's your trade-off. You could certainly use a 1.25 cubic foot enclosure, um, and that would provide you with good response, and hopefully cabin gain would help kind of pick up the slack there. But if you want a more neutral response, then you would have to go with a really, really large enclosure. Now let's see what the manufacturer's spec ported enclosure size relates to. Now I use the manufacturer spec for this enclosure modeling and they say box info, uh, port volume is two feet and port area is 25 tuned to 35 Hertz. So that's what I did. And this green is what you see here. And you can see there's a huge bump there at around 50 Hertz and then a, a pretty steep fall off after that. I don't know. It's going to depend on what you're after. I mean, if you're spending 50 bucks on this subwoofer, you probably just want it to bang. You're probably not so much concerned about linearity. And if you just want it to bang, then yeah, throw it in a ported enclosure and call it a day. If you want linearity, then you want to put it in a larger sealed enclosure. And I would probably say maybe two cubic feet is a reasonable uh, interpolation between the manufacturer's sealed enclosure size versus what my results are recommending. My final conclusion, really, $50 subwoofer, I'm not sure what to expect. Obviously, I've tested other subwoofers and gotten better results, but they were all two, $300 or more. With this particular subwoofer being $50, I wasn't really sure what to expect. And frankly, if they would just fix the inductance, they would have a really solid performer on their hands. This could be a really, really solid performer with maybe five to 10 bucks more toward the manufacturer and or toward the consumer. And I think that if people knew what they were getting, then they would be happy to pay it. And as it is right now, I mean, I can't not recommend the subwoofer for $50. I think it's probably a, a reasonable entry into base, but certainly you're not getting like the cream of the crop, but I don't think anybody's expecting that. Based on its price, I can kind of give it a good recommendation, but if you're looking for something that really has really, really good performance, expect to pay up more money for that. You're probably looking at $100 plus for speakers that are gonna give you a lot better performance. And in the end, I shrugged my shoulders. It's 50 bucks, if that's what you've got, go ahead. But if you can save up a little bit more money and maybe wait things out a little bit, I would see what the next tier up is gonna provide you. And hopefully one day I'll get around to maybe being able to test that. But for now, it's a $50 subwoofer. It performs like a $50 subwoofer. And honestly, it performed a little bit better than I expected it to be. So if that's your budget, I'll recommend it. But if you can save money, I would say probably do that and try to get something that has more linear throw and better distortion figures. And with that said, I'm out. I hope you guys enjoyed it. And again, please leave a like or comment. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask. And uh, yeah, that's it. You guys take care. Peace. Believing for so long. I'm all out of love, what am I without you? I can't be too late to say that I was so 